Mr. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, We live in succession, in division. Meantime, within humanity is the soul of the whole, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. Please stay with us for Mr. Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, The Oversoul. Greetings, ingenious viewers. I am Irene in Ocean City, New Jersey, USA. The people of the United States of America send you our kind regards. In today's episode, selection from Mr. Ralph Waldo Emerson's essays, first series, The Oversoul, part one of two. We present to you Mr. Emerson's Transcendentalist View of the Soul. Ralph Waldo Emerson was an American essayist, lecturer, philosopher, and poet who led the Transcendentalist movement of the mid-19th century. Emerson wrote on a number of subjects, never espousing fixed philosophical tenets, but developing certain ideas, such as individuality, freedom, the ability for mankind to realize almost anything, and the relationship between the soul and the surrounding world. He remains among the linchpins of the American Romantic movement, and his work has greatly influenced the thinkers, writers, and poets that followed him. When asked to sum up his work, he said his central doctrine was the infinitude of the private man. Emerson believed that all things are connected to God and, therefore, all things are divine. His views, the basis of transcendentalism, suggested that God does not have to reveal the truth but that the truth could be intuitively experienced directly from nature. When asked his religious belief, Emerson stated, I am more of a Quaker than anything else. I believe in the still small voice, and that voice is Christ within us. There is a difference between one and another hour of life in their authority and subsequent effect. Our faith comes in moments. Our vice is habitual. Yet there is a depth in those brief moments which constrains us to ascribe more reality to them than to all other experiences. For this reason, the argument which is always forthcoming to silence those who conceive extraordinary hopes of man, namely the appeal to experience, is forever invalid and vain. We give up the past to the objector, and yet we hope. He must explain this hope. We grant that human life is mean, but how did we find out it was mean? What is the ground of this uneasiness of ours, of this old discontent? What is the universal sense of want and ignorance but the fine innuendo by which the soul makes its enormous claim? Why do people feel that the natural history of humanity has never been written? But he is just always leaving behind what you have said of him, and it becomes old and books of metaphysics worthless? The philosophy of 6,000 years has not searched the chambers and magazines of the soul. In its experiments, there has always remained, in the last analysis, a residuum it could not resolve. Man is a stream whose source is hidden. Our being is descending into us from we know not whence. 
The most exact calculator has no prescience that somewhat incalculable may not balk the very next moment. I am constrained every moment to acknowledge a higher origin for events than the will I call mine. As with events, so is it with thoughts. When I watch that flowing river which, out of regions I see not, pours for a season its streams into me, I see that I am a pensioner, not a cause, but a surprised spectator of this ethereal water, that I desire and look up and put myself in the attitude of reception. But from some alien energy, the visions come. The supreme critic on the errors of the past and the present, and the only prophet of that which must be, is that great nature in which we rest as the earth lies in the soft arms of the atmosphere, that unity, that oversoul, within which each person's particular being is contained and made one with all other, that common heart of which all sincere conversation is the worship, to which all right action is submission, that overpowering reality which confutes our tricks and talents and constrains everyone to pass for what he is and to speak from his character and not from his tongue and which evermore tends to pass into our thought and hand and become wisdom, virtue, and beauty. We live in succession, in division, in parts, in particles. Meantime, within humanity is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. And this deep power in which we exist and whose beatitude is all accessible to us, is not only self-sufficing and perfect in every hour, but the act of seeing and the thing seen, the seer and the spectacle, the subject and the object are one. We see the world piece by piece as the sun, the moon, the animal, the trees, but the whole of which these are the shining parts is the soul. Only by the vision of that wisdom can the horoscope of the ages be read. And by falling back on our better thoughts, by yielding to the spirit of prophecy, which is innate in every man, can we know what it saith. Every man's words who speaks from that life must sound vain to those who do not dwell in the same thought on their own part. I dare not speak for it. My words do not carry its august sense. They fall short and cold. Only itself can inspire whom it will. And behold, their speech shall be lyrical and sweet and universal as the rising of the wind. Yet I desire even by profane words, if I may not use sacred, to indicate the heaven of this deity and to report what hints I have collected of the transcendent simplicity and energy of the highest law. If we consider what happens in conversation, in reveries, in remorse, in times of passion, in surprises, in the instructions of dreams, wherein often we see ourselves in masquerade, the droll disguises only magnifying and enhancing a real element and forcing it on our distinct notice, we shall catch many hints that will broaden and lighten into knowledge of the secret of nature. All goes to show that the soul in man is not an organ, but animates and exercises all the organs, is not a function, like the power of memory, of calculation, of comparison, but uses these as hands and feet, is not a faculty, but a light, is not the intellect or the will, 
but the master of the intellect and the will, is the background of our being in which they lie, in immensity not possessed and that cannot be possessed. From within or from behind, light shines through us upon things and makes us aware that we are nothing, but the light is all. A man is the facade of a temple wherein all wisdom and all good abide. What we commonly call human, the eating, drinking, planting, counting person, does not, as we know of him, represent himself, but misrepresents himself. Him we do not respect, but the soul whose organ he is would he let it appear through his action would make our knees bend. When it breathes through here's intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through here's will, it is virtue. When it flows through here's affection, it is love. And the blindness of the intellect begins when it would be something of itself. The weakness of the will begins when the individual would be something of himself. All reform aims in some one particular to let the soul have its way through us. In other words, to engage us to obey. Of this pure nature, everyone is at some time sensible. Language cannot paint it with his colors. It is too subtle. It is undefinable, immeasurable but we know that it pervades and contains us. For more details, please visit the Project Gutenberg, the first provider of free ebooks at gutenberg.org. Brilliant viewers, we thank you for being with us on today's Selection from Mr. Ralph Waldo Emerson's Essays, first series, The Oversoul, part one of two, here on Words of Wisdom. Join us again for part two of The Oversoul. Now, please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television. Coming up next is Tree People, Let's Plant the Future Together, part three of three. May the soul of the whole, the eternal one, enlighten your life. For more details, please visit suprememastertv.com forward slash W-O-W.